first man who is, um, most of you know, my predecessor in the history of Esther series. He was the creator, the founder of the series. He was also, um, he's been in higher education for 18 years, which is probably the longest he'll stay in anything in his entire life. He's got a beautiful daughter who is our mascot, and she is quite a young lady now. Um, he's very extensively traveled through Europe, get, had some businesses over there when he did some studies in history. And um, I'll let you read everything about him. He's a very interesting gentleman. And he gave, taught me everything I know about this. So hopefully I can live up to his potential when he started this. Um, I'm going to bring up Dr. Dr. Mayer to talk to you about Dr. Bell. Know that we're going to have a few uh, people speaking tonight. So when he is finished, I'll return to the podium for some more, OK? Enjoy. OK. Great, everyone. I'm uh, honored to be able to say a few words about Christina Bella. But obviously, it's a bittersweet honor for those. I think most people know that Christina was just a, a great presence in the history community and many other communities of South Louisiana. But she passed away a little under a year ago, which was a great loss. And so this lecture then is a scholarly lecture as usual as the history of Christina Bella, but also, I think, hand in hand with a memorial by a lot of people that thought a lot, a lot of her. So it's very difficult to summarize Christina because she was so unconventional. And really, she was beyond that. She had her own convention that was unique only to her. And she would often make me smile, even though she didn't really mean to. And then I thought it was a far superior convention than anybody else had. She was just unique, not only as a person, but also in her, her history. So foremost, foremost, Kind of the theme of it all, I thought, was that she, that Christina, in her history and in her life, she had a way of bridging two intellectual worlds effortlessly. That of the elite academic world, but also the average common world. And uh, I, to this day, I don't know how she did it. First and foremost, she was a historian, and she really transcended the genre in a way that shouldn't have been possible. She was, I think, one of the top historians in the nation, and she, to do history the old school way, the right way, she would do the hardcore primary document research and then take what she found, no matter what political part it, it might have offended or whatever, just to take exactly the history of what she found and to put that in a very readable style. And so, it was, there's, I personally have done a lot of history, but I've never gone to the depths, the real history of getting in dusty archives and, and for years on end uh, to do that. So she was great with that. But almost uniquely, she also had a literary flair. She was able to take this, these good solid facts where the good history is, but to do it in such a way that the book itself could stand as a literary work, as a novel, as just readable on its own, and so the, her use of language was almost poetic. And in her writing then, it was almost as if she was an engineer with the dry facts and a poet at the same time, which should not be possible, but she kind of did it effortlessly. And in the hundreds of works of history that I've read, I've never seen another person do both. Everyone that I've ever seen, if they have a, the dry facts and the historical depth, you have to give up that literary part and vice versa. But so she managed to do both. She also managed to transcend whatever narrow subject she was writing on and then somehow, just in the small details, tell the spirit of the age, whatever age she was talking about. So just in a normal, natural way of telling you about the pers about a person, the reader came out knowing about everything in society at that point. And so uh, that was just a gift also, very, very rare. She was also a scholar. She was just as equally comfortable talking about high level obscure literature and obscure writers that I didn't know anything about. But if she could talk with the greatest experts and with languages and with theater and you could list almost any other academic discipline. And she had the range to, to hang with the best of them. So, which was, which was very good. 
So Christina had a long history with the History Lecture Series and with St. Bernard. And in fact, I first met her probably a little over 15 years ago. And I was just a new history professor here getting the History Lecture Series started. So I very naively just decided, well, why not start with the most prominent national level historian who happens to be there, which happened to be Christina Bella. And so I knew nothing about her background. So I just kind of called her and said, would you mind coming to speak for free in this very small history lecture series thing? And looking back, it was kind of, you know, I, I don't know that it was the proper thing to do. I probably expected to watch too much, so I didn't realize it. And not only was she happy to do it, but she actually thanked me for the opportunity. And she was absolutely sincere. I came to find out later that we'll talk about she had a very a long history with St. Bernard and loved St. Bernard and, and, and especially the people of it. And so she would, in kind of her first career, before she was this famous historian, how I knew her, she actually spent 20 years in St. Bernard teaching at the teaching seventh and eighth graders and then at the forerunner to New Nest Community College. And so she was just great with that. But the part that I liked most about her that I think connected the most, was this idea of what I call a non-elitist flair. So she was a scholar, a high-level scholar, and she did not sacrifice any of the scholarly integrity, but it would be delivered to an average person, which I consider myself, and the people of St. Bernard. And so we'll, so she could paint, she could uh, Harvard PhD, she could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, and was comfortable in that world as well uptown too late and those kind of things, but also just what I think in St. Bernard, the History Lecture Series, people who are very knowledgeable, very intelligent, interested, all that kind of stuff, but maybe didn't have graduate level history and probably glad not to, but she was just as appealing and she liked those people, talking to those people more, and I kind of put myself on that as well. So with this combination of very high level academic but also for the average person, the best example that I came across was she was, it was the Louisiana Book Fair, and this was a couple years ago. The Louisiana Book Fair gave her the Writer of the Year Award, which means she was the top writer in Louisiana for that year. Absolutely well deserved. And writer, I'm saying, not a story necessarily, but of any kind of writer, fiction or otherwise. And so she was being given the award. It's a very big festival that occurs in Baton Rouge. Uh, it was the opening ceremony, so she was presented with this august award and lots of very high level intellectual people around, that kind of thing. Billy Nungesser, who was the, who was the lieutenant governor then and now, so he was, as the number two elected official, was presenting the award to her and, talk, and giving her an introduction to everything. And so he presents the award, does a good job, and Christina gets on, and it's just as intellectual and sincere as can be. She's giving her appreciative comments. And then she refers, with absolutely sincere respect, she refers to Billy Nungesser as a coon ass. <laughs> <laughs> just going along with big words and all that. And then, and you can tell by looking at Billy Nungesser that that was the best <laughs> event he'd ever been a part of. And he appreciated that more than anything. And she just had that feel. Now, she didn't care if he was offended or not at all, <laughs> but somehow it just, she managed with her skill to, to be able to do both. So it was um, just a great example of the two worlds. So, let's talk about then, which you would appreciate the subtleties of the word. So this lecture then is about the history of Christina Bella, <coughs> but with two different parts. The first part of the history is that we're gonna talk just a little bit about her personal history. And in doing this, for most of this part, I'm really using her words in talking about her history because her words are much better than mine could be. So with the early years, she was born in New Orleans, but at the age of four, her parents moved her to a very rural uh, place in Louisiana, about six miles away, I looked at it, Pearl River, Louisiana, because her father wanted to live in a rustic isolation. And so obviously that's time a lot more isolated, kind of backwards and rural than today. She said she lived in a small country town, a squalid backwater of contented rural ignorance. 
and that her classmates in those years were youngsters stained all over with poverty. All right. But she she sang this with love. Like she appreciated that and she knew that it really formed a lot of who she was. Uh, she was able to attend school in New Orleans at given times and escape that. And so she was much happier to have a little bit more opportunity there. So as you mentioned that after the anxious childhood and 12 years in various schools, she managed to make it to LSU um, on Lyndon Johnson's student loan program at the time. And she said on that beautiful Baton Rouge campus, the world opened up for me. She went from a situation where she did not have a lot of opportunities to explore the world of education, of intellectual ideas, all that, and she found that almost accidentally, serendipitously at, in LSU, and that and she's gonna spend her whole life kind of trying to give that same experience to other people as well. That's the thing we'll see going through all this. She did not quite finish a Bachelor of Arts in History in English, but she left to come teach at St. Bernard at the age of 20. And she uh, taught at St. Bernard and St. Bernard Public Schools. She finished her degree by correspondence courses, and that was even a little bit before my time, but of course that's the, the old school online learning. You know, same kind of thing, but it's mailed back. And so um, she mentioned that whatever maturity she developed, it was the 13 years of teaching uh, as she said, in an earnest, hard-working community. She loved every part of that because she could bring back this sense of wonder, give the sense of wonder that she had gotten in kind of similar circumstances. So she would tell stories then about teaching these college classes that night where the students would come, maybe uh, adult students, have worked at hard jobs all day, obviously be exhausted, but then stay till 10 o'clock and later just wondering about the subtleties of poetry and other things, that she could give that. And that she said that poetry was no longer an occult mystery to them, to the students. Their noses were no longer pressed to, to an imaginary glass shut out of the edifices of intellect. So these opportunities then uh, to make it, she always kind of playing for the next generation. During her time in St. Bernard, she was, she started, she volunteered to write a column in the St. Bernard Voice about, well, I guess, crit, being critic, doing reviews of theater and arts, uh, music around New Orleans. And she mentioned that she loved that possibility because it allowed her free admission to all these plays and operas at a time she couldn't afford it. So that column was written for decades, almost until just a few years ago, I think. And she always had a very, very kind spot for um, Ian Roy and Sister Maisie, who said they were dear people, and kept that column going even when she went on bigger, better things. I read the column a few times, and I have to say it's not my thing. And so, but I could tell that the the high-level critique, you you could tell that it's sincere, and but it's very, very good too. And so, uh, the she went 20 years, and then she retired. So she's still about 40, early 40s, and she's going to go on to the next phase uh, of being a college professor and what I call a formal historian. After her master's, and you know, she started working on her PhD at night in Tulane, at Tulane, and eventually, as she said, she finished her PhD uh, well in the middle age, and she's going to earn a PhD in modern European and U.S. history from Tulane. She'll also start teaching at Tulane. And uh, she mentioned that she, she taught here for a long time. She liked all of the students, but she liked best the working adults coming back to college, undergraduate first, and then later graduates. She went on teaching the Masters of Liberal Arts program. And once again, show, just bringing that same wonder of, of academic life to people who maybe have not had the opportunity to have it before. In addition to teaching, college, she did a whole number of things. She was a consultant to the U.S. State Department of a number of things. She was on C-SPAN and Book TV and all those kind of programs quite often. She lectured on river and boat cruises and the composer Thea Musgrave adopted the work Intimate Enemies, which we'll talk about in a little bit, for an opera from Talba. 
and it was performed at the New Orleans Opera. So, uh, so that kind of fit with a lot of it. But most of all, just even including all the history stuff, far away and wasn't even a close second, the most important thing she did was that she homeschooled her daughters. She retired from St. Bernard, mostly so that she could homeschool her daughters. And she always, as she said, she she married at the last possible moment, had daughter, had kids at the last possible moment. And so she, uh, her home in New Orleans was a, a small red church, and it was a literal church before that she kind of converted and lived in there. Her, where she did her homeschool, her kids the whole time in that place too, she did her writing in what was the steeple of this little church. So it was at the front, and if you can imagine, a very small church. She had a spiral staircase that went up to it that was very narrow, and had this little tiny room that she spent hours after hours, I could picture her doing those things, you know, doing all the books and everything. And so for her daughters, who she homeschooled from the beginning all the way through 12th grade, they both, they all got, went on to college, they both earned PhDs, and they both became educators, as she says, like, like their parents. So she's very proud of them, kind of in their 30s now, but very, very successful. And often she mentioned that was her greatest achievement by far, you know, took, took the greatest pleasure in it. All right, so just a few, you know, could, there are lots and lots of these, just uh, pictures of her, so that I thought were very good. Not surprisingly, a lot of those she had participated in the history lecture series almost from the beginning and very frequently in the Battle of New Orleans Historical Symposium and anything else that we asked. But these were during Katrina when the auditorium was flooded out and we just, you know, everything was gutted but we patched it up to do it. So that was kind of perfect to have her speak. That was her environment, you know, to give up these high level intellectual but accessible lectures in the environment of sheetrock and, you know, very, everything messed up a little bit. Uh, so just a, <coughs> she had a very infectious smile as well. All right, so now moving on then to the history of Christina, history of Christina Bella, her scholarly history, what she wrote. And so overall, and I had said before, is there's no real measure of it, but I think there's no doubt in my mind that she was a national level historian. And I, I can't think of another in Louisiana and the New Orleans area that would be up to her level of acclaim. She was nominated for two Pulitzer Prizes and had a nomination for a National Book Award. But probably, in my opinion, the highest honor that a historian or any writer could have would be an obituary in the New York Times. Of course, it's not an honor any, any historian would want to have, unfortunately. But, so, but that shows if, if you make it there, then, then you're national level. And so I can't help but show, of course, Christina had that obituary. And it was, um, it was very, very fitting, I thought. Where it says, Christina Bella, 75, author of sizzling, sizzling works of narrative history, Dodds. All right, so just especially that sizzling works of narrative history coming from maybe the top critical uh, journal of those kind of things, uh, very, very good as well. Christine was, at, for her history, was absolutely old school. As I mentioned, it was the history itself that mattered. It was the ideas. She never prejudged. She always picked very interesting topics and just did the research and solved where it happened to go. And for the folks who have come to the lectures, you might have seen that for most of our lectures, it's the images that matter to a lot of people, you know, to kind of keep things going, to keep it interesting. But Christine was absolutely old school and never once had a PowerPoint. Never once had any images. She would just have that microphone and often like to walk around if she could. And somehow, with none of that, even for the modern folks who, who need those videos or images, just her words, just the ideas, would keep everybody entertained. And so, I, always, people would come out 
and talk about how hers were the most entertaining lectures of all, even without all that. So, which is quite a testament. All right, and like I said, she really, she was the most politically incorrect person I've ever known, and seemed to take, not that she took pride in it, but she just didn't care so much that, that it just kind of came out. And so, but somehow, despite that, people really didn't get too offended. I don't think they probably did, but they didn't, not around me. But she kind of came out on the right side of being politically incorrect. If that, if that is, is saying something like she was almost always for the, for the underdog, for the people who needed help, uh, all that. And so she just had a, she had a way about it. All right. So her first major work was Intimate Enemies: The Two Worlds of the Baroness de Pantalla. And so, looking at it, so about 1997 is when that was published, and this is when she really, she really made it. This was the work from her dissertation for the Tulane PhD that she turned into a book. And so, when she started with it, this is very typical. So, the Baroness de Montalvo was a very famous person in New Orleans history, which we'll talk about. But she just, she didn't really. I got very practical and efficient in my writing, and I, I can't take a lot of time to do one thing because I want to do so many, and it's I just do research very efficiently and all that kind of stuff, which is absolutely the wrong way to approach history. She had the right way. She just found a good topic, and she was just going to do whatever it took to get at the, the, the meat of that topic. So she picked the Baron from Talbot, uh, because she had a very good story, a striking story, as she mentioned, but also she just assumed, this Christina just assumed, that all the documents of her life would be in New Orleans, because that's where she was famous from. And so, and if you're doing any kind of research, especially primary research in archives, that's all important because it's expensive to make trips, you got to spend a lot of time, so that's the first rule of being a history student is you have all your sources close by. But she said after she'd gotten into several chapters and got into it, she discovered to her horror that the Baroness Pontalba had lived 67 years of her life in in France, which meant all the primary documents would be in France. All right. So what did Christina do? She just decided she'd go to Paris for three months to go to the archives there. She brought her children along in their peanut butter sandwiches. And that they were younger at the time, and she went and did the hardcore research. And I'm not 100% sure, but either she, if she didn't, she knew some French already, she needed to learn to be fluent in order to do that research. And this is, I can't imagine the time and effort that that would take, because if you've ever been in these old kind of archives, it's handwritten. And it's, a lot of times people have very bad penmanship. And if it's in a different language, on top of that, it's just, it's crazy. I, I in my travels, I, I would say that I got to be somewhat fluent in Russian, but I could never do any research in the Russian archives, because I would never, it would just take me years to do even basic stuff. But that's just how it works, and so she put in the time to do it, and did very good, you know, so did all the research, she was going to, when she was going to write, even from early on, though this extensive research was involved, she also wrote it not to be a scholarly tome, as she said, but to write it so that an average reader would enjoy reading it, all right? which is, once again, very hard to do with this very detailed research. So she described the Baroness de Pontalva, who was a Michaela Palmanester, she described her as a plucky little Creole who built the Pantalva buildings on Jackson Square after her father-in-law shot her four times and killed himself. All right, so if you, if you have not read, this is one of the best to read if you haven't already. It's just an amazing story of, takes place in Louisiana of the 19th century and in France. And just the most horrible life where the, she, got an inheritance very, very young, and then people tried to, her, she was married, and the father-in-law did everything she, he could over many, many years to steal that inheritance, 
And then finally he couldn't, so he tried to shoot her. And I think shot her four times and then didn't do that correctly. And so she didn't die. And so then he killed himself because of the shame that would have caused anyway. And so just the, the most amazing story you've ever heard. And so she's able to do it in a very readable way. That book, Intimate Enemies, it's just, she's just, this is just her first book based on her, her dissertation research. But just so happens it landed on the cover of the New York Times Book Review, which is about the highest praise any work of history could have, or any, any writing could have. And there it was picked up for review by every major newspaper in the country, and then it just it, it spiraled from there and kind of brought her into that, that rarefied world of being a, a national level historian. So it, it, when I'm reading the book, of course, on the face of it, it's this very detailed history and very good, just rock solid, all the stuff that I look for. But then also, kind of without even realizing, especially me not being from Louisiana, essentially all of what I know, what I feel to be correct for Louisiana and New Orleans, you know, say from that late 1700s to the late 1800s, I got from the incidental descriptions of things in her book about the All right. So I got a feeling for the spirit of the age, what life was like, how hard it was, the diseases, all that stuff. Incidentally, that's not what the book was about, but all that was included. So that was her great gift. The, and the famous part about the Bears Patalba, Patalba buildings around the French Quarter that had a very ornate uh, wrought iron you know, fences or whatever, that are railings that are gonna set the tone for a lot of the architecture for later on the French Quarter as well. But also did a lot of other things. Uh, it's very, very uh, accomplished, though, very tragic story for the Paris de Botol. All right. Her next book, all right, notice, and we're going to see the, the huge amount of work, except for this one. I want to notice the difference in the dates for the publication, because she would put years of work, and we'll detail that, in each of these. With uh, very, very amazing. So the next one was The Hitler Kiss, a memoir of Czech resistance. Her dissertation advisor was Radomir Lusa, and so she co wrote or helped write or wrote with him his story of being in Czechoslovakia resisting Hitler. Right, so the, once again, worked with the trends, the topic itself, completely it could not be more different than the Baron's Patala though it is a, bi a biography. But so she'll, I'm, I've actually not read that, but I'm sure she captured this very different age, very important age. And there's a hit for kiss. All right, the next, next major one of her were, was Indecent Secrets, the infamous Murray murder affair. So notice, so kind of discounting the, the one she co-wrote, about a nine year gap of Full research, writing, every step of the way, just so much detail. Most of it spent, I think, in her little steeple study. I can, I can always picture that. And so this, the Murray affair was a was 1905 court case in Italy that was the equivalent of the O.J. Simpson trial from an earlier time, and uh, where a prominent woman got four ad admirers to kill her husband and a soap opera-like inner workings of all that happened. And uh, as she said, that based on the story, a soap opera ran on Italian television for 10 years because of the twists and turns. This was covered by every major newspaper in Italy, in Europe, other places too, on a daily basis. It was such a sensational affair. And uh, so it, yeah, very interesting in itself. Reading it, you get the feel of what turn, you know, turn of the 20th century, Italy, Europe, the spirit of the age, all that. I'm uh, pretty sure she had to learn Italian in order to do the primary document research to get these sources, which is just amazing. And she also took her daughters to Italy, to Bologna in turn, um, during the first summer. But that, I think they were in college at the time, so it's probably a little bit more fun for them 
that time. I can just say that I took my daughter when she was nine to Paris, and she really didn't like it at all. And so I can't imagine, you know, I think maybe Christine might make it a little bit more fun and all that stuff. So anyway, so that just, just to do all that and keep up with whatever job she had and her family and do all that research, an amazing thing. All right, so, and once again, a key, the key was, I think she just found a topic that interested her. And no matter what the sacrifices would be, she just went for it and then eventually did it. Right. A totally different spirit of the age. She could not use her, most historians are going to use their previous works, build up all that background information, and just, it's only a short jump off to write another history on a similar topic. A lot of your background stuff is done, maybe even your archival research is already done. But Christina didn't do anything easy. She picked brand new of all of it and had to start from scratch from each one. Uh, she did that again with her next major book, George Washington Carver, Alliance. Once again, after about eight, nine years of research. So George Washington Carver was a scientific giant in the 1940s, but has really, maybe not for the folks in here, but really has kind of tailed off in, in history books. He doesn't get mentioned a heck of a lot in today's age. But he accomplished a lot, especially with agricultural research and uh, other things as well. Very, very fascinating topic. She didn't have to learn a new language this time, but you can well bet that the handwriting analysis taken to do that for hobby handwriting would be tough. She also got into little, little political issues over this, and she was actually uh, banned from Tuskegee because Booker T. Washington, who was most people have heard of who's kind of the head of it all, really didn't treat George Washington Carver very well, and that kind of came out of the resources. And so she was going to write it the way it was, and that and the people there got wind of it, and so so banned her. But I think she liked that. I think she appreciated it. <laughs> you know, that was like a little feather in the cap that she was doing something right if, if she got banned from these things, all right? So once again, in reading this book, it's about a, an individual, she does her biography stuff, but as I'm reading, and I've read many, many works of history solely dedicated to the kind of segregation South and what it was like back then. And so I, that's where I understood most about that whole era, that spirit of the age, was when I read her book on kind of a different topic, all right? She had that gift, all right, so. And then, so going along, and finally, her very last work that, that was probably going to be her most important on a national basis because of current events and other stuff, she is going to, to write about Attic Turk and the unveiling of, of Turkey. I don't know if you know, so after World War I, when the Ottoman Empire, which encompasses most of the Middle East with one of the three major empires that were on the losing side of World War I. So they were broken up. And parts of it, and Turkey was kind of one of the main parts of the former Ottoman Empire. Ataturk is going to not allow Britain, France, and others to kind of take over an imperial way this remnant of the Ottoman Empire. But through the force of arms, has to fight several other countries, rises up and Turkey becomes an independent country because of him. And then he's always an Islamic country, but he will very forcefully change many of the Islamic traditions, Muslim traditions that we're looking backwards and bring Turkey to the modern age. So fast forwarding until today, Turkey is more of a secular country. And so they would wear suits as opposed to traditional Muslim dress. Still a Muslim country, but more modern versus maybe some of the other countries have been much more successful prosperity-wise for people and other stuff. So a fascinating character, one that I independently taught about in my history classes, being absolutely key to current events. She had finished one of her major biographies on him, had, had a finished manuscript. Imagine doing that, how different that 
environment was, that context, and those different languages. I'm not sure if she actually learned the language, maybe we'll find out, but she had to come close to it. So the, uh, she had finished that, and it was about ready for publication. However, when she passed away, and so we hadn't heard, I guess with her family maybe trying to get it published, or we hadn't heard about that. But so especially if anybody's keeping up with the situation in Turkey today with Erdogan and, and Ron Chapman, who's also a fellow history professor, he firmly believes that it's almost a matter of national security that he get that manuscript to the folks at the State Department so they can understand what's going on in, in uh, current affairs. And really, I've never seen any other good biography that she captured all that. So we hope that that's going to come out. But once again, a biography of an absolutely fascinating person has nothing to do, a totally different age, a totally different location than anything else, and that was very classically Christina. So the just the kind of um, the few more general things about her writing style, which I thought was fascinating for all these biographies. So what she would do is she would simply pick a topic that nobody else had really researched that much before. It was fascinating to her, and there couldn't be a greater diversity of those topics. And so just to explore new ground, she would write four drafts, and, and for a historical crafts person, this is, this is just crazy to me. So her first draft is what she called is what she called a kitchen sink compendium of her notes. So keep it in mind. So you go to the archives. Most of it, really, you don't sit there and write out stuff. You go to the, you get a copy machine and you spend a hundred bucks or two hundred bucks making five cent, twenty cent copies of all. You have to locate information, make all these copies, have huge amounts bring all that back, sift through, put all that in. But her first draft then, uh, she says it's organizational, she puts everything in there, and that the draft is probably three times as long as the finished book. And so if you see out there, her books are about like that of small type. Imagine a draft starting like that. I'm lazy, I try to make it as efficient as possible to get it done, but that's not, that's not the right way to do it. She definitely did. All right, and then she said that's the most tedious. Then in the second draft, she, she throws out the things she can and kind of rearranges the story, rearranges things. This is what I think is the most impressive. The third draft then is where she pays attention to writing style. So she's got this massive information that's pretty much organized. Uh, she, she has a thesaurus and a dictionary out. And she goes line by line and asks herself, can I say this in a better way? Can I say this in a more entertaining way? And just just crazy amount of uh, tedious craftsmanship on that. And then finally, just the fourth draft is the polishing of the writing, which she says is the most difficult, where she just further plays with the language to make it readable. So to make it to where it really is the works of history, they are literary works, irrespective of the facts in there, which is very, very amazing. And so with the, so with my history of Christina Bell then, I told you how I first met her. You know that I asked her to come speak at the History Lecture Series at Nunez, which she did and she thanked me for. I think it was, and I've talked to her on many occasions, I think it was probably two or three years before I even knew she had taught in St. Bernard and knew she had taught at Nunez Community College. That part never came up just because it was kind of a, her humble, kind of genuine nature. And then, and finally, so of course, most of the time we're all in speaking engagements. We get together a lot. But really, in the last year or two or three, we got together very often, and I just considered her a friend. We'd get together for lunch about once a month. And we have almost never talked about history, which is crazy. I'm not sure exactly what we talked about, just about life. Just she would give me advice, all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, the so I, I think the world is a lonelier place now, and she's not in it. But I definitely appreciate her history and her legacy. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Judy Dr. Mangles. Um, very interesting lady, lady, and we're going to do a little bit of something off-key right now. Um, I know a lot of you know Ron Chapman. He could not be with, yet with us tonight because his daughter has a nonprofit that she's doing a fundraiser for, but he was very close with Dr. Bella and wanted to say a little bit, so we have a video that we're going to play right now. Greetings all. I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but I have a prior family commitment. This is especially disappointing to me because Christina Bella meant so much to me. Not only was she a personal friend and a great colleague, but she was a mentor. I've known her for years, and anyone who knows Christina loved and embraced Christina. She proofread my book for me with tremendous help. I did the same for her. And most recently, the book she finished was on Camille Hedderturk, which sadly, I finished proofreading and we never got a chance to talk when she passed. It's truly a masterpiece. I hope it gets published. It's very important. She was always there for everyone, the lively personality, the beautiful smile, and that incredible gift for conversation. She will be missed. She will be missed by everybody who knows her and loves her. She will be missed by the historic community because she offered so much, her many books, her insights, and especially she will be missed by me, who feels like I not only really lost a very close friend, but a very dear collaborator. I'm glad we're taking this time to honor her. I wish I could be there. And uh, I don't know, what else can you say? This is her passing is so sad. And she'll be missed by all. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have one other lady that is very special, um, and Christina thought she was very special as well. We're going to bring her up. I don't really need to introduce her because she's got some things to say that we'll introduce her to you, Ms. Nora Wetzel, please. Hello. I first met Christina when she was giving a lecture about Madame Tabla to the Sociedad Española, a group that tries to keep the Spanish history alive in New Orleans. Later, I met her at an Argentine tango event where she was awesome on the dance floor. She invited me to a lecture that day that she was giving at Octavia Bookstore about Dorothea Dix. Then we were both in an advanced French class with a teacher that we didn't like. And she passed me a note under the table asking if I would consider dropping out of the class and speaking French over coffee at her house. So we became dropouts. <laughs> and we spent two hours speaking only French every Wednesday for two years. In all these French conversations, we shared a lot of personal information and became friends. She was my historical and cultural resource, and I was her medical resource for the minor questions and referrals. After she was diagnosed, um, she continued working and finished two books. I even came to know the details of George Washington Carver's life and Ataturk's during our French conversations. Then she started a reading club with a retired literature professor who was a friend of hers and friends. And we worked our way through Shakespeare, the Greek tragedies, and the works of the English playwrights before she left us. And we are still meeting weekly now, plowing through Faulkner. It is the liberal arts component that was missing from my nursing curriculum. She introduced me to so many people that have become dear friends, and also brought me to the Battle of New Orleans Symposium here at Nunez, where she spoke. Through this, I became acquainted with Dr. Manning, Ron Chapman, and Michelle Miner, who have all helped me in my role as president of the Louisiana Historical Society by being keynote speakers for our Battle of New Orleans banquets. On every ride to Nunez, Christina always spoke so highly of the people of St. Bernard and the time she lived here and worked here. We all miss her. We're gonna round this evening up with my sentence about Christina. I'm gonna try not to get emotional. Um, I was not a friend of hers, but you could never tell that. 
There was never a person that walked up to her that was a stranger. She impressed me so much as a person. I thought of her as a demure southern belle with a really feisty spirit. <laughs> and she, she was the, the woman that I emulated, I think, in a lot of my thought processes when I didn't know which way to turn, with what to say, or how to act. She always had the right way. And Dr. Manning alluded to this. I remember watching her speak and thinking that I was not in a lecture, that I was watching a storyteller. And she was fabulous at that. She touched my heart immensely. And she will be incredibly missed. And I'm going to thank you all for coming tonight before I really lose it. <laughs> and if you would um, join us again next month, where we'll, we will be um, looking at the true Abraham Lincoln. Thank you all for joining us. And thanks again, ladies and gentlemen.